everybody, Karen Bryant here with Angela McKill Hill. And it is another edition of What Had Happened Was. What Had <laughs> Happened Was. Uh, and, uh, uh, all right. And listen, folks, here, we are working on a theme song and like graphics and all kinds of stuff. We're a two woman operation here, though. I don't know if people understand that, Ange. Two girls trying to figure this all out, and we can do it. It's just going to take us some time because we have a bunch of other stuff going on, too. Yeah, I just got to get out of fight camp. Because you sent me the 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 song, but I still I haven't listened to it. I'm such a dork. Yeah, I still haven't listened to the song, so that's on me. The ball is in my court, guys. <laughs> it's my fault. Don't blame Karen. It's all my fault. <laughs> I just got to beat a bitch up, and then we're going to have a theme song. Exactly. Plug in some noises from the fight. <laughs> exactly. And maybe we'll, we, we, we need like a, a graphic to like a frame for our show and stuff. So we'll get to that. But for yeah. those of you, for those of you in on the, on the ground floor, we appreciate it. Um, but so as you can see, I'm, I'm on vacation right now. I'm up in uh, Seattle just taking a few days off, but Angie, it's, it's fight week for you. So like, I don't know, like how you were, you were doing cage warriors last night. Like how did that fire you up more for this week for your own fight? Yeah, it was kind of cool because um, the week before fight week, you taper down. So you yeah. end up having a lot more free time. And the thing I hate doing is getting stuck scrolling on my phone and looking at things. And you always see stuff about yourself, even if you're not looking for it. And uh, it could just get you like overly anxious, get you overthinking what you're going to do. So instead of that, I had a bunch of research to do on fighters that I haven't really followed. And that made the week go by a lot faster. Yeah. I felt prepared when I did the commentary cage side. It was my first time doing it. And the venue was insane. Like it was it was probably the best show that I've been to in San Diego, like the best local show. They did it on, um, it, it was like called Humphreys at the Bay. But like there's like um, the backdrop is the San Diego sunset and a bunch of boats, like, in the bay. Nice. And then it, it looked like something out of Street Fighter. It was really cool. <laughs> so I think that it was it was a really cool venue to fight on if, if there's any local San Diegans or yeah. just local people on the West Coast that are looking to fight. Try to get on the October card and Cage Warriors because I know they're looking for fighters. And uh, it was an awesome event to be a part of. Cool. You know, it's funny, too, because do you remember – like I didn't, you know, obviously I'm not a fighter, but I remember going to ballroom shows and yeah. like the smaller shows and stuff. And it is really cool. So how did that feel, you know, like going back to that? Like, did, did you feel kind of like pat yourself on the back a little bit? Like, look how far I made it because you come full circle. Like I used to be up there fighting on a small show. Now I get to commentate it before my own big pay-per-view spot. Like you had to be feeling yourself a little bit. No, it was it was dope. You you're totally right, Karen. I feel like you've been there before in your own way. But yeah. uh it was it was really cool just because uh we had this show called Friday Night Fights in New York mm -hmm. City and it's a Muay Thai show, but it's the same deal. It's like a smaller promotion, but it felt like a big promotion. Like you yeah. have a big crowd, you have like the lights, the cameras, they do a good job with um getting announcers in there mm -hmm. and commentators. It, it's like a whole production. So it's cool going back to that and, and being on that side of it, yeah. especially after doing like ESPN with you and, yeah. and seeing how the pros do it too. So I could bring in my little professional skills that I learned <laughs> into the smaller show as well. Yeah. So I felt very prepared for it and it was, it was a lot of fun, but yeah, I was, I was definitely feeling myself a little bit. And there was a little bit in the beginning where I'm sitting there with Graham and and we're talking about the fights and uh, in the crowd I didn't realize they plugged in the audio so the crowd could hear us behind so nice. like hello San Diego and then I hear the echo and then the crowd's like wee <laughs> nice. so that was probably my favorite part of the night I was just like oh he hello San Diego yeah well yeah. I have <laughs> it, no, I feel you. I've literally told people like my two favorite things in the world are a hot mic and a live crowd. And yeah. I'm like, I swear to God, that's my favorite thing. And so like, whenever I get to do anything and find it, I, I, it's just the most fun. So like, I've done jobs where like people have hired me. And by the way, you could still do this people if you're watching this, but like hired me to work at 
conventions and stuff and work their booth. And I worked for this company called EVS one time. And they were so funny because they were, they're like this European company and they're a little more kind of like straight laced and stuff. I was like, Oh no, I'll get everybody in your booth. And they're like, oh, okay. I'm not sure. I'm like, Oh no, I will. And so I'm on the mic and I'm like you, cause you know, it's in Vegas at the big, at like CES yeah. or whatever. I'm like you in the red shirt. Yeah, I see you. You need to come over here. And like people are like, what? And I would bring people, I had people cracking up. I was like, I don't even care. A hot bike and a live awesome. crowd. I love it. So I, I know what you mean on that. Um, okay, but so keep that in mind. Yes, yes. Keep okay, but I so have a few ideas. <laughs> good. Um, what is your idea for what you're gonna do to Tisha in the rematch? Like, what's your, what's your, what's the biggest, like, what's the biggest issue? Wanting to be better than you were the last time, or like just straight out wanting to win? Like, what, what, what's your, what are you really looking for here? Um. Well. You know, it's 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 kind of a tough one because we fought so long ago, yeah. and I feel like even when I fight, when when I fight someone who hasn't fought that often, I still don't go back that far when it comes to tape. Like I'm not gonna go right. back to their last their fight in 2015 right. to see what they look like now. So when I look at my most recent fights and when I look at her most recent fights, those are what I'm judging. That's what I'm yeah. trying to. Um, those are the things that I'm trying to pull out, like her weaknesses, my uh, strengths, like where can I capitalize on this girl? And obviously I want to get the win. Obviously yeah. I want to settle the score or at least even up the score and be able to have that, have that loss taken back because mm -hmm. that is my technically my first loss. Um, yeah. When I fought on the ultimate fighter, it was an exhibition bout. I lost to Carla Esparza, but it didn't go on my record. Right. So, Tisha, I mean, mentally I still counted it, but it didn't go on my record. So Tisha yeah. was technically my first loss. So to and to get that one back, to be able to beat her soundly, beat her like uh, in in a way where there's no split decisions. Mm -hmm. It's not, especially if I don't leave it to the judges, like it would be amazing to finish her. And I've been working on game plans to get that done. Um, but to be able to do that is just going to catapult my confidence mm -hmm. uh catapult my um my progression towards the title shot and uh and it'd just be uh great you know it'd just be fun to do so i'm really excited about it i feel like um stylistically it's a really good matchup mm -hmm. and um yeah i just feel so ready like i just feel like everything that i've been doing before I got the name Tisha Torres mm -hmm. uh, has been leading up to me beating her just like skill wise, just yeah. uh, the things that I've become really proficient in. So yeah, I'm excited. Cool. cool. And the thing that's interesting too is, I mean, you're compared to me, I think you're very petite, but even Tisha's even tinier. Um, and so I know it sounds weird, but like there are challenges of being the taller fighter, right? When you have to fight somebody a lot smaller for her, she has a lot of, uh, you know, yes, she may be punching up, but in terms of takedowns and stuff like that, like she's got much more of an advantage there, right? So what is the hardest part about fighting somebody who's like that much smaller than you? I mean, I guess um, it's not, she's not that much smaller than you, but she's small. She, she's, she's a little small. Um, I, I mean, I think, uh, maybe I stand a little taller than her too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think the biggest difficulty is is throwing punches and bunches, knowing that they're gonna shoot. And yeah. I don't, I, I really don't think that she's that great of a wrestler. Mm -hmm. um, I think when she fought me, that was the easiest way to get the victory is to take yeah. me down because I didn't ha really have more than a sprawl. I didn't understand scrambling. I didn't mm -hmm. understand. Um, you know, sprawling, but then doing something else when that doesn't work and then doing something right. else and then not going flat on my back as soon as the takedown is complete. Right. You know, I didn't understand all that part. So that was the easiest path of the path of least, least resistance. Right. Um, but I, I really don't think she's that amazing of a wrestler. I feel like I've fought better wrestlers mm -hmm. in, in my last like three or four fights. So um, that is, the hardest part to deal with when you have someone who's short and likes to grab, but 
there are a lot of disadvantages too. Like it's mm-hmm. easy to easier to keep them away because your arms are so long, your legs yeah. are so long. Uh, you just have to worry about them grabbing like an ankle and then climbing, right, and then- up, <laughs> climbing up it like a rope, you know. But if right. you're good at using your range, then it's easy to keep them away, or easier to keep them away than someone who's about your same size. Right. And also, um, just that in and out pressure that she likes to do she's Mm -hmm. very springy on her feet and Mm -hmm. that comes from having those short little compact legs you know they're like little little uh little people legs (laughs) so she can dart in and out she's like a little pony you know she can dart in and out and just literally run after she lands a shot just run Mm -hmm. away so that she's the only one scoring so i think those are the, the biggest uh the biggest uh, issues that she's going to mm-hmm. bring to the matchup, the fact that she can dip under at any point, especially if I get a little hungry with the punches, um, and that she can spring in and then bounce away. So right. those are the things that I have to work on, uh, controlling that that rhythm, controlling what angle she goes out, and being mm-hmm. there before she gets there, or being able to hit her before she peels out. And then knowing that as soon as I get crazy, She's going to duck under those punches. So being ready for that, getting my elbows in, throwing elbows, throwing knees, anything at the center that's going to stand her up so she can't just go, whoop, get the takedown. So those are are like the things that I'm aware of now that I had no idea existed (laughs) (laughs) when I first bought her. In five years, I mean, that's like a... That's like a master's degree and then a year uh, a year in the field, you know? You yeah. learn a lot in five years. So I'm, oh, it's been six years. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, no. I learned a lot in the field and I got a promotion, so. <laughs> exactly. No, it's great. Yeah, no, and it's true, but you're right, because she, she's so, she is physical, like, you never, you know, you're, also, she's not going to get tired, too, right, like, she, she can just keep kind of going and going and going, um, but yeah, I, I also think the, uh, that when I look at you, the two of you matched up, too, I think of, like, Sandhagen and Marlon Marais, like, the head kick option is always there, too, when you're fighting somebody, um, smaller, especially if they're going to be going down, like, you know, so, yeah, she's obviously going to be, kick. yeah, she's going to be looking <laughs> out for that from you, <laughs> Um, yeah, well, it's exciting. And so you guys now, were you always on the main card or is it, or did you get moved up because of, uh, the Pena, um, uh, uh, title fight getting knocked out, which is a bummer. Cause Amanda, I actually heard that she had COVID before that all got public. And so that was a real bummer. Like they all got it and stuff. So it sucks. So hopefully they're, Are they, they're, they're, you know, if they're sick at all. Or... No, they were, that's the whole thing. They all three of like wow. Nina got it too, apparently and stuff. And so it's not, like, it sucks. Yeah. And, you know, I think people, I feel like there's this weird stigma in the MMA community where people don't want to admit how sick they've gotten. Right. Uh, when, when Because it, it, it feels like a sign of weakness or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I really feel like people should talk about it because, like, there's so many fighters who won't get vaccinated, who won't, like, you know, even just deal with wearing a mask in public yeah. when when they're coming close to a fight and it's like, dude, like I, I don't care about your political beliefs or whatever, but if you're coming up to a big payday and you have to not test positive for COVID in order to get paid, why would you risk that? You yeah. know, why would you risk it? This is a huge payday and there aren't that many fights right now, like compared to before the pandemic hit, yeah. there's not that many opportunities. So you're giving up a rare opportunity um, and being just being kind of uh, irresponsible with that. I think if people came out and talked about like, hey, I got sick and or I tested positive co- for COVID and it wasn't yeah. like a hoax, I actually got sick and I couldn't train and I couldn't walk around. Like, you know, Rebus kind of came yeah. out with that. I thought that was, that was uh, you know, unique in, yeah. in the sense where you don't hear fighters coming out that often and saying that, Hey, I got sick and it really fucked me up and it, and I couldn't fight because of it. And to your point, and I'm I'm pretty sure he talked about it before and if he didn't now, well what had happened was Kamaru got really sick after he fought oh, Jorge no. the first time. After he came back from fight out like he was bad to the point where mm. he he like said he was like crawling to get to the phone to like call the and like bad bad. And I I guess he didn't he thought he it, it was bad. Um, we know about like hands of steel got it really bad, right? But I know what you're saying because it, it's true. A lot of people haven't have just kind of rolled with. I think Durino got it kind of bad too. I think mm-hmm. 
I think Jacare had it not great. Like, yeah, a lot of people, I, I was fortunate, not good. I got it and it just felt like allergies. It didn't, I didn't have it bad, but I'm also not a professional athlete pushing my body to the extremes that it could have taken me out further. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeesh. well, yeah, hopefully the rest of the definitely. fight stay intact for this week because it's good stuff. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Hey, okay, so I want to know your thoughts on, I know we we're just doing a, a quicker show today, um, uh, on on our Uriah Hall and, and Sean Strickland, because a lot of people going into this one thought Uriah was going to win. I, I thought Uriah was going to win, not because Sean isn't great and Sean's been streaking and doing so well. It's just that Uriah seems just more technical and more, um, you know, more experienced there and stuff. I don't know. He just, he just... I just thought he was going to win, but the one factor for me was how was he going to feel going into the octagon after what had happened with Chris and how would that play, you know, how would that play out? Man, it's it's hard to know if that had anything to do with it or yeah. if it was just Strickland's pressure because the first thing you noticed in the fight was that Strickland was landing the jab that didn't look super impressive, but it was making Uriah react. And I think a lot of times people don't realize that like a stiff jab can just interrupt your whole thought process. It can interrupt your movement. It can, it can rock you, you know, yeah. it can rock you. It looked like it might've messed his nose up and that was bothering him, bothering your eye a bit. And in the last round you saw him let loose. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's because there was nothing to lose at that point. It's, you always think, okay, why didn't he do that in the beginning? But the reason he didn't do that in the beginning is because every time he thought about doing it, he was getting jabbed in the face. So it's hard to know if it was Strickland's pressure and the fact that, you know, he's just very good at the way he fights, or if Uriah just wasn't feeling it, just didn't feel like hurting someone. And, I mean, Strickland isn't, like, someone that you wouldn't want to punch in the face. <laughs> I'm just going to say, how, do we, how are you going to delicately explain? I, I want to hear, go ahead, Angela, explain. I want to hear what well, you're about to say here. I've been in the same, like, uh, I've been in the same sparring room as him. And I've, like, he does the same thing every time. He's, like, the same trash talk that he does while he's fighting. Uh, the weigh-ins were really funny mm -hmm. where they faced off. And he's, like, sloppy. I'm not sloppy. You know, like, he's, this is, this is him. He just, like, his thought process is out in the open. Everything yeah. that goes through his head comes out of his mouth. You know, so it's it's funny because you'll be in the same room as him. And you'll be like, why does this guy shut up? But like that kind of guy, that guy kind of guy can frustrate you. They can really yeah. just like either take you out of the fight or make you do something drastic that that gets you hurt, that gets you countered, that gets you knocked out. So um, I think it's a really good strategy for him. It works for him. He's able to. It's kind of similar to Kevin Holland. He's yeah. he's able yeah. to just add that extra wrinkle and, and disrupt someone's flow state. They're never able to get going, maybe. And you didn't see too much talking in his fight with Uriah, but going into yeah. it, I'm sure, and this is the thing that can sometimes fuck up a fighter more than people understand, I'm sure a lot of people hit Uriah up and was like, dude, I hope you knock this guy out. Like, I hope you knock this guy. And, like... To put that pressure on someone, like, it happens, like, every now and then, it'll happen to me, where people are like, oh, I don't like this girl, for whatever reason, they just right. were rude to them when they met them, or maybe uh, they, they like, had a falling out with that person's gym, and they just don't like him, and they root against them, but it, it always happens, like, no doesn't mean that Strickland's yeah. a bad person it just there's always like people out there saying that so when you put that pressure on a fighter and I'm sure a lot of people did that because of how Strickland is um it can it can throw you off it can make you put too much weight on the fight or too much yeah. weight on everything you do and you're not just fighting someone you're like trying to prove a point or trying to do something for yeah. for the world and and it can be too much it can it can definitely be too much so because Uriah is such a sensitive soul i'd like yeah. to say seems like a very sensitive fighter the fact that he he knocked out anderson silva his idol and was in tears afterwards like this this guy is a sweetheart you know mm. like he's a monster but he's also a sweetheart so i feel like the fact that he he does have um 
he he does think a lot in his fights that could have um, stifled him a little bit. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what the reasoning is either. That was just something I was thinking of, that it would be really hard to go back to work knowing that the last time you were in there, something really tragic happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, that, that would be hard just in general, whether how you, no matter how you felt about the person. And it's funny with the Strickland thing, because the dude is unique, you know? I mean, he's a character, and there's some stuff that he said. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. That scares me. <laughs> like he said something <laughs> on the thing, like in the post fight presser, I guess that he, he really thought it'd be cool if he killed somebody one day inside the octagon. It's like, yeah, that, that I, I actually don't think that that's funny. And like, I don't no. know that, but it's like you said, think it, say it, think it, yeah. say it. And there, there are times. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I like his enthusiasm for the fight game. I like his, um, I, and it is entertaining. Like you said, like Kevin, like that Marshman fight where he was, come on, Jack, come on, Jack. But I, I would imagine if I was Jack, I would, like you said, it would be such a mind F, like if you were losing, but then the guy's like taunting you and egging you on to keep punching him. And you're like, it would make me crazy. I can see how he would be one of the most incredibly frustrating people to train with or, or to fight. And Alan, uh, Joe Ben, you know, he, they used to train together and he said that, yeah, like, for a while, Sean used to be a guy that could beat you up in the gym who didn't perform that well on fight night, though. Like he, mm -hmm. you know, and he was, you know, he used to fight at welterweight. He was massive and he, he could really put the hurt on people. But it wasn't oh, yeah. like so something changed to where he's now able to perform better, I guess, in uh, at Showtime. He wasn't maybe always like that. Um, remember, you know, he had a car, a motorcycle accident, right? The guy almost died. So maybe oh, that yeah. also has something to do with his mentality of having come so close to death himself. Maybe he... Mm -hmm you know, doesn't fear it now, right? Like maybe he's just, yeah, like maybe that completely changed his mentality now. I don't know, but um, but he's yeah. a wild man. And, yeah, he's, he's a wild man. <laughs> and I, I, like sometimes, um, I, I know it sounds stupid. I probably shouldn't even say it, but sometimes like um, when I do get nervous for a fight, part of the thing that calms me down is just thinking about the fact that when I die, no one's going to remember any of this you know right. like right. years later like maybe maybe if I have a good legacy it can last last maybe like 10 20 years afterwards yeah. but no one's gonna remember this moment where I was nervous no one's gonna remember me getting punched in the face once you know like it's it, it takes yeah. a lot of the pressure off where you just don't put too much weight on the future you just stay in the moment and mm -hmm. him having that free flow of verbalage <laughs> while he fights, that could be like a good way of him just like training himself to stay in the moment. Especially if yeah. he had kind of that like performance anxiety before where he's like beating people up and then going mm -hmm. out and not performing as well as he does in the gym. That's a, I mean, I think he discovered a way to get over his hangups and unfortunately we have to listen to it. <laughs> no, you're right. But it's true because you, you, you're right to put stuff in context because I know that I do that even just on the show. If I mess something up, I'm like, oh my God, and I'll ruminate on it forever. And then I'm like, wait a minute, KB, the person didn't, A, they didn't even hear you or whatever, or you were on mute, or they were also on their phone while you were doing the show. And they were also like, I was like, the thing that I stressed out about, I'm sure nobody else noticed that much. And yeah, at the end of my life, like, are they really going to be like, hey, remember KB that time when you said the wrong name on the thing? And yeah, like, yeah, exactly. it's not, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, for Uriah, though, the flip side is interesting because, like, I remember, and like I said, I, I don't know if it was just it, 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 what it was, but, you know, like, sometimes what do you do if you just show up and you don't, you're just not in the mood to fight, right? Because it happens. Because on the flip side of that, that time that he knocked out Gay Guard with that kick, I remember talking to Gay Guard after, and he's like, I didn't want to fight. He's like, I got there, and he's like, I just didn't. Yeah, or, or that might have been the Jacare time, or it might have happened to him twice, but I do remember like okay. times that he lost, where he's like, yeah, it was so weird. You know, you do the whole camp and everything, and like some days you just get there, and you wake up that day, and you're like, I don't care. I don't want to yeah. do it. I don't want to be there. And like, it's so weird to think that, while you have control over it, you like, you don't have control over that, right? Mm -hmm. Like you might just wake up and not feel it that day, right? You can be not feeling it the entire fight camp, but you <sighs> feel that pressure to just keep going and keep working because you know, this is something that I do. This is my livelihood. I, yeah. I signed the contract. I have to show up. And I mean, people, people do that for mm -hmm. their nine to five people mm -hmm. do that whenever, but, um, 
you know, look at uh, Simone Biles, like this is a very interesting case where if you show up and you're not mentally there, you can die. Like, yeah, you, yeah. you can, you she can, can die. die yourself you can get really messed up to the point where you're you're like I should have just not shown up so uh so it's really interesting trying to figure out that line of like whether it's just like am I just am I just being uh am I just like tired am I just anxious am I just not feeling it but once I get in there I'll be okay or is this something deeper? Is this something that's really going to get me messed up? And the same thing, uh, we saw, uh, Max, um, Rashop, uh, he had that, uh, he was the guy who quit after the second round. He's, uh, and was tapping everyone out. And then they brought Mm -hmm. him into UFC on, I think he had a week's notice, but he's such an ace on the ground. Like everyone expected him to blow through the guy and he ended up, just like trying, trying second round. He, he, he like gassed himself out trying to get a quick finish. And Mm -hmm. then in between the second and third round, he quit on the stool and you could just hear his coaches saying, come on, you're a champion. You got this. This is what you have to do. And he's like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. He's like, uh, no, (laughs) get out there. And then the uh, ref goes up to him. He's like, do you want to fight? And he's like, no, I'm done. And then they stopped the fight. And that was, I think, the first time you've seen you see it, you've seen it in mm-hmm. the UFC recently, in recent history, where someone retires on the stool um, and they weren't, like, concussed or anything. Right. And so it, it definitely seemed like a, like a mental thing, like, a, mm-hmm. like crippling anxiety or something, mm-hmm. or just mm-hmm. something that just shuts you down. You, you, you can't even dig for that last ounce of energy you know you're done and he was just done and then to see him come and he fought on cage warriors last night so that's why that's why yeah, I, yeah. the fights in recent in recent memory um but he came on cage warriors last night and blew through his guy so yeah so it's um it's an interesting thing like sometimes you show up and you're just not mentally there and sometimes sometimes you're ready to go like i yeah. I uh I did a lot of uh work on on my uh mental state and mental preparation mm-hmm. after having a few fights like that where I showed up and I was just like <laughs> <laughs> I don't know <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna do this <laughs> yeah how hard is it to get back into animation you know like yeah, yeah. sometimes it's like that so uh I think um. I think preparing yourself mentally beforehand and doing a lot of exercises to help that work. Yeah. I know a lot of people have sports psychologists. I, mm-hmm. I really recommend people doing that. If, if you feel like it's a really big issue that you need to address, like yeah. sometimes you need help. Sometimes you need a coach, you know, yeah. to, to help you work through that. And, um, and yeah, what, whatever you need to do, do it so you can be there and perform just as well as you do in the gym. Cause if you're, Killing people in the gym, you owe it to your teammates to kill people out there. You can't just be beating up your friends all day. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. You need to go make the money so you guys can have that team party when you get back and all that. Like, thanks, bro, for letting me beat your ass. No, but it's so true because I am, you know, obviously I don't have people swinging at my head and trying to take me off, but like I have to go to work sometimes and just like everybody, right, where you're not feeling it. And I, for various reasons in my life, you and I have both talked about stuffing it down. You just stuff those feelings down. Well, I've stuffed them down for a really long time and I'm really good at stuffing a lot of stuff down. So I can go on the air. Like I've had like literally awful tragic things happen and you know, where I just like have to just go on and be on. Um, and it is, it is a, a, a definitely a skill set I think to be able to compartmentalize, you know what I mean, your feelings and stuff like that, and just be able to go out here and perform and just like I'll deal with that bit later. I'm crying yeah. right now, but I'll deal with that later. But but again, yeah, I don't have somebody like swinging at my head, and I, I just know that the the famous Pat Pat Barry story would tell me like he would walk be walking to the octagon and he's looking at his coaches, he's like, "Am I ready, guys? Am I ready?" And they're like, "No, you ready, man? You ready, Pat?" And he's like, "Are you sure? Are you sure?" <laughs> so like, yeah, I get like there's a lot of um, anxiety going in there um i'm curious what your take is on cheyenne bays and the whole like performance bonus thing for her and a lot of people are like like 
oh my God, I can't believe she, it, like it's life changing and stuff like that. And then they were, they were kind of criticizing though, her for admitting though, that she doesn't save her money or I don't know. It was like a whole thing after like, but it seemed like that I missed that. I didn't get to see that fight, but it seemed like it was incredible just from, from uh, the highlights I saw. I mean, you know, Dude, that was a knockout. Great, it was a great opportunity to take advantage of that cold main spot. Like yeah. I know they lost like, 50 fights on that card, right? I know. So they kept pulling fights off. The fights, like, oh, get yeah. cold, the injuries, all that stuff. So right. she ended up in the cold main. And I know people are like, what? Like, what the hell? Right. But she came out and she showed out. So great way to take advantage of that. She, mm -hmm. um, she did her game plan perfectly. She wanted to take the girl down. And then when the girl started getting up, she made her pay. So it was... <laughs> such a well-timed kick like I was I was legit jealous I'm like bitch, bitch I want to do that yeah 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 <laughs> I do that since I've been in the UFC like yeah. that was such a great way to um to get your name out there to mm -hmm. just uh, be impressive and you know I had when I was in the UFC the first time around I had very little money like yeah. I, I was lucky enough that I had a bar job and a husband Mm -hmm. And both like worked and saved. And when I yeah. uh, went to train to get on the Ultimate Fighter, I we got a roommate. I went to North Carolina. He mm -hmm. had a roommate in in our apartment, so we could split the like right. we did a lot to try to save money. But we had maybe like ten grand saved up, and ran through all of that in the process mm -hmm. of me um, getting my first MMA fight. Uh, getting on the ultimate fighter, being on the ultimate fighter, and then getting my first two fights in the UFC after that. Like we had very little money and, you know, he was working the whole time, but it's, it's just hard to save and hard to, mm -hmm. hard to save while you're training full time. So yeah. most fighters are broke. Most fighters, um, especially when they're fully committed, they'll let their, their account go into the negative. Yeah. Just to ends me because you got to pay coaches you have to pay your rent you have to have a car to drive to practice like there's all these things you you need like if if she's has it like health care is a good mm -hmm. idea because if you get injured that's you in debt for the rest yeah. of your life you know so it's it's really it's like fighters have to pay for so much without making anything especially when they first start out and like yeah. you think you're a pro fighter you're making money you're making scraps like if you're like a good promotion will pay you like five and five if you're lucky i got paid yeah. three in three my first mma fight because it was so hard to find an opponent so mm -hmm. i had to take money out of my purse and give it to the person who the girl who showed up just to get someone to fight me because i had such an extensive muay thai record right. so it's it's so hard starting out and you're not gonna make shit until mm -hmm. like maybe your third or fourth fight because like that contract is it starts off i think 12 and 12 now when mm -hmm. i first got into you it was eight and eight and if you lose a fight you're only getting eight grand for an eight week fight it's it's so it's such a harsh sport man it's such a harsh sport and that's why i'm always like you know fighter pay like raising the fire pay would be great for the sport um you know when i get to a place where people listen to me maybe i can try to help yeah. make that happen yeah. uh but you know once you once you get to a good spot you're good like i'm good mm -hmm. right now i was able to buy a house um i was able to you know i i can my husband doesn't have to work other jobs anymore yeah. we're both committed to this mma lifestyle and just going in the fight camps like i'm paying him through that yeah. and uh it's it's uh it, it takes a lot of grinding to get there mm -hmm. is what i'm saying like it's not it's not something that everyone can attest to like mm -hmm. i can i can work i can fight full time i can train full time mm -hmm. um it's hard it's hard to get to that position so happy for her that she got that 50 grand that's life-changing it her. is yeah my 50 grand after fighting Andrade, that was life changing for me, you know, and yeah. um, and it's only going to get better for her the more she performs well. It's great. And it, it is it's it is life changing and it's um, exciting for her to, like you said, take uh, that opportunity and really capitalize on it. But it, it is so interesting, too, because the, the fighter pay thing, like 
your guys are prize fighters, right? You like you got into yeah. it. You you know you you fought for the prize. Sometimes the prize is going to be big. Sometimes you know it's not, and you have to earn your way up. And that's the thing. Like I know people right now will be like, "Oh, KP, you're just being a corporate chill for your boss." But here's the thing: uh-huh. we're all underpaid, right? All of us think every single person out there watching this or listening to this is like, "I should make more money." Like oh, we oh. all think that. You know what I mean? We definitely do all think that. But I remember, I think back to when I was starting out and trying to get into the TV business, broke ass in New York, totally in debt, borrowing money from my parents, you know, you know, like, yeah, you, you, it sucks. You, and especially living in Manhattan, you know, you walk out your door, you hemorrhage money, like on down the end of the block, you just lost 20 bucks. Like, I don't know where it went, you know? (laughs) So yeah, it's like, we all, we all struggle. And so I remember, yeah, like crappy jobs, doing stuff for free to get exposure, you know, like all of it. So it's, it is relative. Like we all do it and we all have to go through the hard part and struggle and it's the same thing. I remember like getting a job for the first time, like at my MTV job. And I was like, you're going to pay me what now? Now I know wasn't much money at all. But back in the day when I was 21, 22, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to make this much money. I want to live in Manhattan. I think of it and now I'm like, oh my God, they stole me for that much money. It was nothing. Nah. You know what I mean? But it was a great job and it was MTV, right? So it was kind of like the same thing of like, well, I didn't get paid that much, but I got in the USC and like, so it is also still on you to try to make something of that opportunity. Right. But, um, I guess my point is just that I, I hope she continues to, um, succeed. And I hope she also learns how to manage her money because that's the whole thing. If she, (laughs) if she admitted that she doesn't spend that well or whatever, or something like that, like that is something. Uh, Yeah. I think she said something like that. Like I said, I, I could be wrong, but, um, and also the fact that she and her husband are both fighters too, that yeah, like collectively they should take a page out of your and Adam's book and, and learn how to manage that because if they are going to both succeed, like, yeah, they need to, they need to hopefully take this money and do something smart with it, invest it in, you know, make a little nest egg. Job. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody needs a job. <laughs> Y'all better get that OnlyFans going. <laughs> Couples OnlyFans are pretty popular, I hear. So, are you serious? To every anything, you can think of any subject, and it'll have a following. And on OnlyFans. All right, that's weird. <laughs> oh, on a side note, though, I am going to sign up for Cameo. Um, so I'm going to be doing that. So if if people um, and I will keep my clothes on and that, but. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sign up for that. Uh, and so, uh, this week, so if people hopefully, uh, you know, uh, will we'll, I don't know. Do you do that? A lot of, a lot of the folks at UFC are on Cameo. If you look, there's like everybody that I work with. So I was like, wow, what the heck? Yeah. I mean, it's great because, um, because you have that voice on ESPN and on UFC. So yeah. people want to hear that professional voice. <laughs> It, saying stuff about them, you know, right. like, hey, this is Karen Bryan, blah, blah, right. blah, and I'm talking to you for your birthday. Like, that's that's always fun. Like, yeah. I think Bruce Buffer is probably the coolest one out of yeah. all of those. Like, who doesn't want to hear Bruce Buffer say their name? Like, I, I get excited right. when Bruce Buffer says my name. So, uh, so yeah, Cameo is dope. I, I don't do it because, uh, I don't know, I'm just kind of lazy with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, I, I would want to go all out for it. Right. So I would just put it off and put it off and then I'd never I'd never do it and then everyone would want refunds. <laughs> well I, I told like Aurora an amazing one and then I get too lazy to do anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you're saying because my whole thing too is I, I as I was saying it, I said it to Aurora, I was like, Oh, this means I gotta put makeup on every day <laughs> Like 'cause if you gotta you know what I mean, if you're gonna I was like, yeah. Well, I guess it's good, it's gonna get my butt, you know, together or whatever. Um you just gotta yeah. Turn them all out, like, right after you film the show. Just be like, all right, let's go. Right That's after right. your uh, UFC spot, you'll be like, okay, I got the professional makeup on. Yes. Let's get the cameos done. <laughs> You're right. Well, it's funny because when we are at the Apex, that's what people are doing all the time. Like you'll hear Buffer doing them in the next room all the time. Like he's just oh. printing, he's printing money off a cameo. It's insane. Oh, that's so. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good for him. It's good for him. All right. Well, listen, we're at 38 minutes. I know we were just going to kind of do a shorter one today because I'm on vacation. You got to pack and everything, right? Yes, I have to pack. <laughs> I hate packing. Yeah. But yeah I, oh, I get to do the press conference too. This is going to be my first press conference ever in the UFC. So I'm pretty stoked about that. Yeah. Are you serious? Well, that's yeah. fantastic. Um, yeah. Okay. So how about, how about 10 bio. bucks for... 
How about 10, 10 bucks for every time you drop a what had happened was during the week, okay. right? I'll, I'll pay you. <laughs> yeah. They're like, Angela, what happened in the first fight between you and Tisha? Well, what had happened was, be care, Brian, every Monday. <laughs> Check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and IR Radio. Yeah, yeah. I Heard Radio and IGTV. <laughs> <laughs> that's so great no that's exciting that's really exciting yeah i'm so and plus that you're gonna have the black beast up in there like the black beast cracking everybody up i know he's gonna be great i'm, I'm gonna try to be his opening act <laughs> uh, hey guys here all night <laughs> awesome right. awesome he's so great yeah well that's gonna be an interesting fight um yeah it is gonna be an interesting fight but yeah so um we will, people, you got, yeah, so you do media stuff and then you have the press conference on Thursday so everybody can watch that as well. Um, but to follow you, Angie, where can they find you to keep up with you all during fight week? Uh, follow me on Instagram uh, at Angie Overkill, on Twitter at Angie Overkill and Overkill Hill. I always do TikToks during fight week and they're usually pretty funny. So check me out at Overkill Hill on TikTok too. Yeah, your TikToks are great. I just remember your Fight Island ones where you're like over there in your uh, yeah. in your quarantine, your quarantine with like careless whisper or something. It was <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Cool. Um well I am on Twitter, uh Karen Bryan, K A R Y N Bryant as in Kobe, no relation. But may he rest in peace. You can also look for that channel on YouTube. As I mentioned before, like I have my vanity YouTube channel, Karen Bryant, but then like sometimes something funky is with it. But all of our stuff is there on my YouTube channel. And also, as Angie said, on her IGTV, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. It is what had happened was we're growing. It's episode 26. We're going to get graphics and music and all kinds of stuff. So hang in there. Just be hands i know <laughs> <Just be> hand signals <laughs> floating <laughs> cool. well thanks for checking out the show folks see you next time see ya